Hello, I'm Gian Maria Grillo, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to a new episode of Conducting Pills, a series where we take a repertoire piece or a part of it and we analyze it from a conductor's point of view. In this episode, we will dive into Schubert's unfinished symphony, its structure, its phrasing, and of course, some technical tips. As usual, you can jump through different sections of the video by clicking on the links present in the description below. Now, let's begin! Schubert's unfinished symphony is one of the mysteries of classical music. It is not his last symphony, and the composer did not die before being able to complete it, as it happened only a few decades before with Mozart's Requiem. Now, the quality of the two movements that Schubert wrote is absolutely stunning, and especially the first movement is the most innovative that he had ever written. So, why leave it on the side? Now, it needs to be noted that part of it is due to Schubert's modus operandi. He used to write sketches here and there and just abandon them as they were. There's a good amount of fragments of piano sonatas, for instance, or string quartets like the famous quartet sets. In the case of this symphony, though, it does seem quite strange that Schubert would fully complete two movements of a certain magnitude and then simply cast the whole thing aside. And yet, that he did. By the way, this symphony was sent as a thank you gift for an honorary diploma he had received from the Graz Music Society in 1823 which makes it even more strange, it's rather strange actually, to send an unfinished work as a thank you gift. Many theorize that Schubert may have sketched an ending that instead became the great untracked in B minor to his stage work Rosamunde, but that's all to be proven. The reasons that led Schubert not to complete the symphony are actually unknown. It's a possibility that the composer considered the ternary time to be too heavy for all movements, and quite unusual for the structure of a symphony. As a matter of fact, the first movement is in 3-4, the second movement is in 3-8, and the third movement would have been in 3-4 as well. Given the fact that he had started and abandoned four other symphonies in the previous years, it could also be the case that he was going through a compositional crisis, at least in respect to his symphonic production. A self-doubt that was perhaps made bigger by the imposing and intimidating presence of another composer, Beethoven, who, by the way, in Vienna, in the same time, was writing his Ninth Symphony. Now, the tone of the unfinished is unusual for a symphony of the classical period. Neither Mozart nor Beethoven, nor Haydn for that matter, had ever written a symphony in B minor key, and constitutes in itself a symptom of the incipient transition to Romanticism. Written in 1822, Schubert never got to hear his work performed. He died in 1828, and the Unfinished Symphony was only performed in 1865, coincidentally, by the way, on uh, December 17, Beethoven's birthday. Schubert revealed his innovative concept, rather different from his previous symphony, right from the beginning, the key of B minor, to start with, and the orchestration. The trombones play in the first movement. This is something that had never happened until now. Not even in Beethoven, who introduces them in his Ninth Symphony in the second movement. Now, the trombone in a classical period had a very symbolic value and was usually associated with death or with life after it. And this opening to a different world is one of the characteristics of this symphony. But Schubert also takes a different compositional approach. We're not going to find here the typical Beethovenian contrast and tensions with radical rhythmic and dynamic changes. This is a more contemplative work, like a story, with a lot of digressions and filled with mystery. A mystery that can be found right away in the first theme exposed by the cellos and basses. There's no harmony in the other instruments, only this line played in octaves. A line that disappears completely in the exposition of the movement, but it will form the basis for the development and the coda. On the other hand, the first and the second theme will see almost no development whatsoever. Introduced by an anxious figure in the strings, the first theme is played by the oboe and the clarinet. Repeated with an echo of the horn. The 
the music relaxes with the forte piano of the bassoons and horns and we're taken to the second theme introduced by an accompaniment of the double basses, violas and clarinet. And notice how the clarinet double the violas to create a darker color despite the G major key. This is one of Schubert's most famous themes played here by the warm cellos. And see how this is antithetic to Beethoven. This theme doesn't strive to get bigger or to get any propelling energy. It actually falls on itself going back to its starting point. And it's retaken by the violins. And everything here is still until a forzatissimo of the full orchestra preludes to something much more dramatic. But that doesn't happen, and part of the second theme comes back as if nothing happened. The trombones add some drama to it, but we're taken back to the G major key and once again to the second theme. A second theme that plays an imitation game with itself. It's picked up by the flute and then the single note of B in full orchestra announces the repeat of the exposition. It's quite evident how this approach differs from Beethoven's, of whom, by the way, Schubert was a great admirer, and incidentally, his favorite symphonies were the second and the fifth. In this movement, the themes are not developed, they are repeated, the second theme on top of everything else. And they don't attempt to push the musical thoughts anywhere, they're more static or, as I said, contemplative. Schubert uses a sort of external element like the trombones to inject drama within the symphonic structure. It's a composing process that will naturally fascinate the upcoming generation of romantic composers. Now pay attention to bar 109 and then 327 in the recapitulation. Schubert holds a tonic B pedal in the second bassoon and the first horn under a dominant F sharp chord. Unfortunately, a well-meant but rather inexperienced editor removed the dissonance by altering the second bassoon and the first horn part. And conductors should check the parts carefully and their score for that matter to make sure that the B pedal is still there. But the entire development is based on the introductory theme. Schubert uses the fact that he presented the theme in the beginning without any harmony to take us to uncharted territories with sonorities that had never been heard before. We start in E minor, but with the entrance of the violins and the answer of the violas and bassoons, we move to different worlds. And notice the chromatism in the bass line pushing the crescendo to the repeated chords. And that explodes in a fortissimo, which drops back to a pianissimo right away. Now Schubert only takes the syncopation that introduced and accompanied the second theme, but not its melody, and he uses them to suspend time until another fortissimo. The same process is repeated until the drama of the first motive explodes in the orchestra. But then again, Schubert takes a different direction. He pulls back to a pianissimo, two bars of crescendo, and all of a sudden we're in a major key. Time is suspended again, and we're taken back to the recapitulation, where Schubert skips the first motive altogether and starts directly from the first theme. And everything returns as it was, almost romantically nostalgic. The introductory motive will come back in a very compact coda, where Schubert will show us different aspects and angles of it. At first, he seems to close the lid with the answer of the winds.
but then he takes one element and repeats it. The final echoes of the first bar come back, bouncing from one section to another. Schubert doesn't even finish the movement in a classical way. After the final chords in fortissimo, the second to last bar has a diminuendo, at least according to Berenreiter. According to Brahms, it was an accent. And this actually falls into the whole kerel of diminuendos versus accents in Schubert's music. He did not have a particularly neat handwriting, and there is an internal debate on the matter. Nevertheless, the way you interpret it affects the whole idea of the symphony, whether it's in the last bar or earlier in the movement. Are you going for violent outbursts or for a resigned take on it? Which aspect do you see the most in these gestures? And it's pretty clear how much Schubert is disrupting the rules of the classical era. There is not that sense of logic that one may find in Haydn or Mozart or Beethoven for that matter, even if in a different way. Schubert brings the irrational component to the table. And that's why this symphony is sometimes addressed as the first romantic symphony. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button below the video and ring the bell so that you will get notified every time a new video comes out. Let me know what you think in the comments below and I will see you in the next episode of Conducting Pills when we will talk about Ravel's Pavan pour un enfant de fun. Till then, Bye bye. I'm Jamir Grillo. I'm a conductor and a com and let's say my name a little better. Extremely innova innovative. Inno is the most innovative, in innovative, innovative, innovative. World is one of the crest. Cr <laughs>